The Battle of the Philippine Sea was almost over. After sunset on June 20, 1944, hundreds of U.S. Navy planes were in the air, searching for a place to land. These aviators had just completed a successful mission against the Japanese Carrier Task Force. In the background, one enemy carrier and two oilers were burning out of control, and three other enemy carriers were limping away with battle damage. Only 20 U.S. planes had been lost to enemy fire. It had been a good day in terms of the damage inflicted by the U.S. Navy, but it remained to be seen whether or not the fleet would pay a heavy price. The remaining 206 pilots and their gunners still had to get back to their ships, and as of 6.30 p.m., that seemed doubtful. The American pilots had nearly 300 miles of ocean to travel, and not a drop of gasoline to spare. Additionally, with the sun about to set, they would have to navigate more than half their journey in the dark, with not even moonlight to assist them. The bulk of the pilots had never attempted a night landing before. To many, it seemed as if they'd been sent on a suicide mission. Their commander, Vice Admiral Mark Mitcher, had wanted to sink the enemy carrier so badly he hadn't devised a safe plan to get his pilots home. As the pilots flew into darkness, radio chatter increased to abnormal levels. Under normal conditions, most squadrons followed strict protocols of radio silence, only using the radio when emergencies arose. Now, as fuel indicators ticked to low levels, a period of crisis arrived. Dozens of panicked aviators announced that they would never make it back to their carrier. Lieutenant Commander Ralph Weymouth led a group of 13 SBD dive bombers from USS Lexington. He remembered the anxiety of the return trek. It was dark. At one time, so many people were talking on the radio, I finally turned it off. I just couldn't stand hearing these guys saying, How much gas have you got left? I'm going in shortly. I've got two minutes left. That sort of thing. I just had to turn the radio off. For the most part, my group was staying together. We were talking to each other, passing information around. We didn't talk on the radio. We used the hand signals, using Morse code, and we exchanged information about how much gas we had left. And we were all drying our tanks out. We had two tanks in those airplanes. I had dried out one tank, so all my remaining fuel was in one tank. I knew I had to use it all. One by one, the American planes began dropping out of the sky, too low on gas to stay aloft. One fighter pilot, Lieutenant Alex Vrechu, joined up with a pack of TBM Avenger torpedo bombers. Cumbersome gas guzzlers, the unfortunate TBMs couldn't stay in the air for very long. Eventually, they all ditched. Verechu remembered the sad moment when they went into the water. I went to the rendezvous area, and I joined up on a damaged TBM that had been shot up. I don't know what carrier he was from. I know he had a little, small three on the tail. His bomb bay doors were dragging and I pulled up alongside him. I'm sure he felt better, having at least a fighter with him. But he gave me the signal for low gas. He didn't have enough to get back. How badly else he was hit, I'm not sure, because it was getting dark by that time. The sun had already started to disappear on the horizon. He stayed right down low and didn't climb up for altitude. His wing lights were flickering, so his electrical system must have had troubles. I kept hearing voices on the radio. It hadn't gotten real bad yet, but the TBM seemed to head toward a group of seven planes that were circling low on the water. And I could hear voices. Guys saying, I've got only 25 gallons of fuel left. I've got a ditch. Another one said, I've only got about 35 myself. I might as well go down with you. The TBM seemed to join this group. They all just landed in the water. It was dark by that time, and I gave them all a heartfelt salute. So then, I was all alone. I still had several hundred miles to go. Meanwhile, the American Carrier Group Task Force 58 made haste, cruising at 20 knots, feverishly trying to close the distance and reduce the returning plane's inbound flight. On the bridge of his flagship, USS Lexington, Vice Admiral Mark Mitcher chain-smoked three cigarettes. Hours earlier, he had made the controversial call to send these planes on their mission, even though he had doubts that they could conserve enough fuel for the return trip. He believed his carriers had closed sufficient distance to allow his pilots to reach the fleet, but in the moonless dark, 
He wondered if his pilots would be able to see their carriers before their fuel ran out. For a half hour, he paced the bridge nervously. Then, sometime after 8 p.m., he gave instructions to his chief of staff, Captain Arlie Burke, to send a message to the rest of his task force. It said, Bald Eagle, this is Blue Jacket himself. Turn on the lights. Before sending his planes on their mission, Mitcher had considered that he might have to ask all his surface ships to illuminate. This did not follow any standard recovery procedure. Under combat conditions, U.S. ships had to remain dark to avoid detection from enemy submarines. To turn the fleet into a bright beacon defied all logical convention. However, Mitcher had always demonstrated compassion for aviators. He knew that they had taken off on this mission without complaint, risking their lives for his victory. Now, Mitcher decided to risk his victory to save their lives. Under Mitcher's directive, every ship in the fleet lit up. The destroyers and cruisers turned on their searchlights, pointing them into the sky, and they began firing star shells, great pyrotechnic flares, that brightened the area for miles. All other ships turned on their running lights and truck lights. The carriers turned on their hooded deck lights and they pointed their searchlights at their islands so the pilots could identify their carriers. Mitcher ordered his staff to send a radio message to the incoming planes. He said, tell them to land on any available carrier. The first returning aircraft reached Task Force 58 at 8.45 p.m. and they marveled at the scene. With so many searchlights pointing into the heavens and star shells exploding like so many fireworks, the scene looked like, as one torpedo squadron pilot remembered, a Mardi Gras setting fantastically out of place. One by one, the aircraft broke into their landing patterns. For the next two hours, chaos reigned as the pilots tried to find their way back to the carrier decks. Although the searchlights and star shells helped guide the pilots to the fleet, once the planes arrived, they had a disorienting effect, making it impossible for the landing signals officers to see the incoming aircraft and for the individual pilots to know when or if they had been approved to land. In just a few minutes, several planes had crashed, either by hitting the flight decks at too high a speed or by running out of fuel while circling in the landing pattern. Everywhere, accidents abounded, many of them fatal. Lieutenant Harold Buell, who was bleeding from two wounds suffered during his dive-bombing attack on Zuikaku, tried to keep his damaged SB-2C hell diver aloft, despite the fact that an AA shell had bored a giant hole through his right wing. With his engine losing power and utterly unable to tell one carrier from another, Buell turned in the direction of USS Lexington, which was not his ship. Buell told his gunner, W.D. Lakey, that he might expect a water landing, but Lakey pleaded with Buell to land on Lexington's deck, admitting that he was a poor swimmer. Buell agreed. With his wounds, he also was not sure he'd be able to swim clear of the sinking plane. Buell pulled into the landing pattern, lowered his landing gear and tail hook, and resolutely flew his way toward Lexington's ramp. He recalled what happened next. As the landing flaps started down, the beast shuddered, and I almost spun in. I stopped the flaps at the halfway point and went to full power. I was in a precarious situation. I was at full power just to keep from stalling. Broadcasting my condition, I emphasized that I could not take a late wave off. Due to the cluttered radio traffic, the call was probably not heard, and no signal to stop my landing attempt came. I was at the ramp in cut position when suddenly, without warning, the LSO gave me a last-second wave-off. In my wounded condition at the ramp, a late wave-off was an order telling me to commit suicide. With no power reserve and staggering just above a stall, to lower either wing to turn away would put me into the ramp, the spud locker, or an uncontrolled spiral dive into the ocean. I did the only thing that would give Lakey and myself a chance to survive. I closed the throttle and landed straight ahead on the open deck. In its dilapidated condition, Buell's aircraft landed atop Lexington's arrestor cables. But instead of catching hold of one of them, his plane took a bad bounce, and it soared high over the crash barriers stretched across the center of the flight deck. 
Unluckily, his helldiver came down nose first into a parked plane. His plane did not explode, but the collision killed two sailors, a deck handler and a rear gunner who happened to belong to Buell's squadron. After pulling Buell out of the wreckage, the men of USS Lexington began chastising him for ignoring the landing signal officer's wave-off signal. I saw two stretchers containing covered bodies near the carrier's island. I asked somebody nearby about them. He replied in an unfeeling way, Those are the two men you killed with your airplane. A feeling of anguish swept over me as I realized that the crash had been the unwilling cause of the loss of two lives, one a squadron shipmate. At that moment, a Marine orderly came up and said that the Admiral wanted to see me at once. I followed him into the island and up several ladders, groping in the darkness until we emerged into a night-lighted space. I did not have any idea what carrier this was, but knew it wasn't Hornet because there was not a single familiar face around me. As it turned out, I was in Vice Admiral Mitcher's flag operations in Lexington. I must have been a pathetic figure standing there in my tattered flight suit, covered with gore and grime from the crash, trying to answer his staff's agitated questions. I was near exhaustion, but still on my feet, probably because of the adrenaline still flowing as a result of the situation that led to the crash. Mitcher's staff officers peppered Buell with questions about the strike against the Japanese fleet and asked him repeatedly how many carriers the American pilots had sunk or damaged. After it looked as if Buell could say no more, Mitcher emerged from the darkness and excused him telling him to report to sickbay and take several doses of medicinal cognac. Sympathetically, Mitcher said, well done in your efforts to sink the enemy's carriers on a tough mission. The next day, Buell received an expletive-filled chewing out from Lexington's air officer and also from one of Lexington's squadron commanders, again complaining about his decision to ignore the wave off. Buell tried to explain his actions, telling the officers that the accident had not been of his own making, but they refused to hear him out, threatening to court-martial him as soon as they had the opportunity. Before leaving Lexington, where he had become persona non grata, Buell acted as a pallbearer for the two men who had been killed in the crash. In traditional fashion, the ship's company buried them at sea. Buell remembered, The flag-draped bodies were placed on low platforms on the port side deck edge elevator at the hangar deck level. The elevator was then raised to the flight deck where the ship's company and air group personnel stood at attention while burial rites, including rifle volleys and taps were conducted. On signal, we lifted the inboard end of the platform board, tilting it so the wrapped weighted remains slid from under the flag cover and dropped over the side into the ocean. Although trying desperately to keep my emotions under control while serving as burial escort leader for a fallen comrade, tears ran down my face as the bodies disappeared into the blue Pacific. The losses of the two men on USS Lexington were not the only casualties suffered during the June 20th recovery operation that historians have since called the Flight Beyond Darkness. Altogether, 82 U.S. Navy aircraft ditched at sea, or crashed on the decks of their illuminated carriers. Throughout the night, Mitcher's destroyers worked tirelessly to locate and recover any downed crewmen. By morning, 90 waterlogged aviators had been rescued. By the end of the week, 70 others had been found and recovered. In total, the June 20, 1944 air mission had cost the task force 49 aviators. Mitcher's decision to recover his aviators after dark and putting his ships at risk to do so may have been a matter of necessity, for Mitcher knew, as well as anybody else, that the future of the Pacific War rested on the shoulders of the valiant men who climbed into their cockpits each and every day. But the decision to turn on the lights represented something more than mere obligation. It symbolized the deep respect that Mitcher had for his pilots and the sense of responsibility he had in himself by doing his utmost to ensure that they did not suffer a lonely death at sea. Forever after, the veterans of the Battle of the Philippine Sea remembered Mitcher as a true exemplar of a compassionate commander. 
One of the survivors, Lieutenant Commander Ralph Weymouth, recollected, Nitscher was adored by all the aviators for what he did. He made every effort to be able to untangle them and get them back aboard properly. And he did the great no-no of turning on lights, firing star shells, and everything else to get all the aircraft back aboard their carriers. I think there were some 98 aircraft lost that night, most of them by ditching. But there would have been a lot more if Mitcher hadn't taken the steps he took. If they did not know it before, after the Battle of the Philippine Sea, every sailor in Task Force 58 knew what it meant to be a good shipmate. 